This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. The African Drums are sounding. Good evening. Welcome to African Drums, the television organ of the Kofi 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and the encouragement of self-activity. I am Elsie Harry and I will be your host for this evening's program. The common understanding is that elections will be held on May 11th, 2015. The common sentiment is that you must register and vote. What happens to your vote is usually not clear and how it contributes to, to the picture that you want to make happen is even less clear. To help clear up the election waters, we have with us now Mr. Vincent Alexander, who really needs no introduction. He will take us through a short course about the electoral system, how it works, and more specifically, how to ensure it works for you. The questions are in three parts that will address the electoral system, a winning scenario, and how to get there. Before we get into the discussion, I have great news for our viewers. The Coffee 250 Committee is currently offering a course in African Guyanese history. It is being held at the Festival City Community Resource Center every Monday and Wednesday at 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. from January 26th to March 18th, 2015. The admission is absolutely free, so please make special effort to attend. Now we'll get into the discussion. Welcome to African Drums, Mr. Alexander. Thank you very much, yes. Okay. Now, as I said, the question is in three parts. So the first part is, could you briefly describe the electoral system that will be functioning in the elections in 2015, May 2015? Thank you very much. As I do that, I want to reiterate something that you yourself already said, which I think is most critical. There is no system unless you go on May 11th to cast your vote. Yes. That is critical. All that I will say will have little or no meaning unless on May the 11th, 2015, Guyanese exercise the civic responsibility to cast their vote. And so I will now try to speak a bit about cast your vote in relation to an electoral system. We have an electoral system which for all intents and purposes came into existence in 2001. Prior to 2001, our electoral system was a straight proportional representation system. That is, a system in which the results were determined in proportion to the number of votes that each party got. It was simply a PR system where you went to the poll, you voted for a list, the total number of votes cast was divided by 65 to determine the value of a seat. The value of a seat then was taken to divide the total number of votes a party got to determine how many seats that party got. And that was the proportional pure proportional representation system. That system came into existence in 1964, been against the background of a constituency system mm. that existed prior to 1964. And so one may want to ask the question, why did we change the system in 1964? There were a lot of opinions out there about that. But the fact of the matter is, that prior to 1964, we had a constituency system where the country was divided into a number of constituencies. 
the number of voters in the constituency was not consistent across the constituencies. Mm -hmm. So you can have one constituency, for example, with 100 voters and one with 50. But each of them represented one seat. Mm -hmm. The result of that is that there is a possibility in the constituency system, first past the post system, uh, that a party could garner seats disproportionate to the number of votes that they would have gotten. I think we have an example not so long ago in one of the islands where a party won all of the seats. But when one looked at the proportion of votes, they would have gotten just over 50% of the votes. With the other party getting 40 something percent and absolutely no seat. The history of Ghana was uh, that traditionally the PPP would get about 40 percent plus of the seats, of the seats, sorry, of the votes, but they would garner 60 percent of the seats. And that reflected the dispro disproportionate manner of the results because of the way in which the constituencies would have been configured in terms of numerical numbers. Now in our society, one that's a plural society with two major ethnic groups, what to a large extent that did was allow one party on the back of ethnicity alone to acquire a majority of seats and to have another party on the back of ethnicity as well with a large number of votes to get seats disproportionate to the number of votes. And so through a process uh, prior to 1964 where Dr. J. Gunn, and I emphasize this, initiated the involvement of Duncan Sands in determining the electoral system with the subsequent concurrence, it wasn't Burnham's initiative, with the subsequent concurrence of Burnham, introduced the PR system to replace the first past the post system. May I repeat, when they were having talks with the British related to independence and there was a deadlock, Dr. Jagan took the initiative of asking Duncan Sands, the British representative, to come up with a solution since there was a deadlock. It wasn't Burnham's original position, but he concurred. Duncan Sands then proposed proportional representation as the solution. So we've had proportional representation from 1964, a system that resulted in a coalition government of the, P of the PNC and the UF. And that system continued in place until 2001. In 2001, we changed the system to retain the advantage of proportionality and the advantage is that people will be able to have their representatives in Parliament in proportion to the number of votes cast for the particular party. The disadvantage is that in a PR system that has no constituencies, there is a disconnect between the elected and the elector. There is no direct relationship in terms of whom I voted for as my representative. You tend to vote for a party and the party then extracts from a list who will go to Parliament. There is no prior knowledge of who the MPs and even after the elections there is no uh, electoral relationship between the MPs and particular geographic areas of the country. So there is a disconnect and it affects accountability and other elements of the democratic system. So in response to that an attempt was made to go back to the advantage of constituencies, and that advantage is when you have constituencies, people can relate to an MP who they know represent their constituency, but at the same time to retain proportionality so you will have a result that reflects uh, the general will of the people. So as of, 9th of 2001, we have what we refer to as a mixed system. And how does, how does that system work? People simply go to the poll to vote in what is referred to as a national and regional election, meaning that they are going to elect 
parliamentarians, and that's a national election, and they're also in the specific regions, and we have 10 of them, going to elect councillors for the regional democratic councils. So you have a ballot paper that reflects a ballot for parliament, the national assembly, and a ballot for the region. And you cast two votes. One vote you can cast for the party that you want for the National Assembly and another vote you can cast for the party that you want for the Regional Democratic Council. However, in casting your vote for the party that you want for the National Assembly, there is a mixed system in the determining the allocation of seats as well as there is a mixed system in terms of how the candidates are identified. Now, our National Assembly has 65 seats. Of those 65 seats, 25 of those seats are contested for in constituencies. The country is divided into 10 constituencies, constituencies which are the same as our regions. So region 1 to region 10 are the 10 constituencies that the country is divided into. Each of those constituencies has a number of seats allocated to those constituencies. And so when parties are preparing their lists, they have to specify who are the candidates for the constituencies. So for example, in Region 4, there are four seats allocated to that constituency. In Region 9, for example, there is one seat allocated to that constituency. In Region 10, there are two seats allocated to that constituency. And across the country, as we allocate seats to those constituencies, they add up to 25 in all. Now, when you go to vote, on that top half of the ballot paper, you vote for the party. When the ballots are counted, what is done in the first instance is that the ballots are counted at the regional level, or what? at election time is called the electoral district. So each region, each constituency is equivalent to what we call the electoral district. The ballots are therefore counted at that level. And then the system of proportional representation is used to allocate seats to the parties in each of those districts. So for example, in region four, all of the ballots are counted. And then, seats are allocated, seven seats are allocated based on the proportion of votes acquired by each party. So let's assume that Region 4 has 100 votes and they have two parties and one party gets uh, 60% of the votes, then they get 60% of the seats. Another party gets 40%, they get 40% of the seats. For neatness, let's say it's 10 seats, just for neatness, for explanation purposes. It means that one party will get 6 seats, no, and one will get 4 seats. And those will be the regional constituency seats. And so in Guyana, the first 25 okay. seats are allocated that way. In each region, the people vote, the votes are counted, based on the number of seats of that region, the total number of votes counted will be divided by the number of seats to get the value of a seat. The value of a seat is then taken to divide the number of votes each party gets to determine how many seats that party would get. And so 25 seats are allocated that way. But the National Assembly is made of 65 seats, not 25. So when that process is finished, then all of the votes are counted. All. When all of the votes would have been counted, that number is then divided by 65 to find out the value of a seat overall in the National Assembly. So we now know what's the value of a seat overall. The Union in Miami have already allocated 25 seats. 
when you know the value of the seat overall, you then take the total number of votes a party would have gotten overall across the regions, and you divide that number by the value of the seat, and you determine how many seats a party is entitled to overall. Having already allocated seats when you did the first count, you then subtract the number allocated from the number they're entitled to, and those seats are then allocated from what is called the top-up list or the national list. So parties get their seats in the first instance by virtue of a tally at the regional level and a distribution of seats at that level. And then secondly, by a complete national tally and a distribution of the remainder of seats taking into account what the party is entitled to overall and how many have already been given at the level of the region. Mm -hmm. And that's the way in which the seats are allocated. Now there's a little intricacy in that because the mathematics is not always exact. You can have a situation where using the value of a seat to divide the total number of votes, that when you add up the seats allocated, you find that you're short of a seat or two in terms of the number of seats allocated. Mm -hmm. Because it's not an exact, let me put it this way, a party may get 100 votes. The value of a seat may be, let's say, 15 votes. In that case, the party gets 15 to 100 gives you 6 seats and 10 votes remaining. It's not equivalent to a seat. 10 votes remaining. Mm -hmm. Now, so you go through all of the parties in that way, but they all may have remainders. When you add up the remainder sometimes, it's equivalent to the value of a seat or the value of two seats, and those seats would not be allocated. What you then do is go to see who has the highest remainder. The unallocated seat is then allocated to the party with the highest remainder. Mm -hmm. If per chance there are two unallocated seats, after you've allocated the first unallocated seat to the party with the highest remainder, you then go to the party with the second highest remainder, and they get the next seat. And so in that way, the parties are able to acquire all of the seats with the unallocated seats in the first instance being allocated by virtue of an allocation of seats to the party or parties with the highest Actually. remainder. And that's exactly how the seats are calculated. And that is separate and apart from the regional elections, where they simply take the total number of votes cast at the regional level, divide by the number of seats, that's the value of a seat, take that value, divide the number of, divide the number of votes each party got by that value, and you know how many seats the party will get. Across the regions, they tend to have regions varying from 30 seats down to about uh, 18 seats, and that's the way they do the calculation at that level. So what, in fact, has been attempted is a system that's not new to the world, it's something that we have in other countries, Germany for example has a system like that, that seeks to do two things. One hand to make the results fair in so far as they're proportionate, mm -hmm. but at the same time to capture the, to capture the uh, advantage of constituencies by having specific MPs identified with specific constituencies, so you can have a relationship with those MPs. But may I hasten to say that this system which I have referred to was intended to be a temporary arrangement. Uh, because of what the courts <coughs> did in, I think, 1997 and said we must have an election in three years, we could not work on a redemarcation of the country into constituencies. And so we decided we'll simply make the 10 regions the constituencies because they were already demarcated. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, though we refer to the 40s top up, there are far more than the constituency seats. I think the idea was that we would have smaller constituencies, probably single member constituencies, and the top up will just be there to bring back proportionality. But now the top up dominates. Mm -hmm. The idea was that after 2001, we would have gone back to Parliament 
and to extend the process of constitutional reform, as was reported in the Oversight Committee, uh, to introduce more constituencies and to make the politicians more accountable by virtue of their presence in constituencies. But unfortunately, our parliament has never returned to do that work. So we stuck with the system where 25 seats are allocated in multi-number, multi-member constituencies. So we still don't have one person, and we know that one person represents a particular geographic area. We have seven persons who represent a whole region. And a large number of top up seats, but that's what the system is presently. Okay, thank you. That I find that the electoral system is really complex if you don't understand certain parts of it. So, for me, I just learned a whole lot about the electoral system. I mean, I've heard it in school, but not in such detail. So, I'm sure our viewers, especially, really appreciated that. Part two of the question is. Could you describe a scenario that will result in an opposition victory for the upcoming election and define what exactly a victory would mean? Well, a victory might mean different things to different people. <laughs> to you. But um, <laughs> a victory really in, in pure terms is that people get what they want. <laughs> Whether it's an opposition or a government, a victory is a victory. Uh, the people get what they want. That's a victory. The people get what they want. I put it in very um, generic terms. Yes. People get what they want. That's the victory. Anyway, let's put it this way. Because of the way our constitution has been constituted, it provides for the presidency to go to the party that acquires the highest number of seats. The party does not have to get a majority of seats, in other words, 50% plus. If there are three contestant parties, none may get 50%, but the one with the highest number of seats mm -hmm. gets the presidency. And that's what happened in 2011. The People's Progressive Party got 48.2% of the votes, they got the highest number of seats, they got the presidency, but they didn't have a majority. The opposition uh, got the majority. Now, the Constitution provides thereafter for the president to exercise executive power. Our Constitution vests executive power in the president and for him to constitute a cabinet. Okay. And so, though a party may not have the majority under the Constitution, we've had the situation in 2011 where the President, having been elected President by virtue of representing the party with the highest number of votes, then constituted a cabinet made up only of members of his party. Mm -hmm. The Constitution does not specify that he has to do that. He is at liberty to go beyond his party to include other persons and in fact it is argued by many that because the constitution speaks about inclusive democracy that in the spirit of the constitution the president really not having garnered a majority in the parliament should go beyond his own party to constitute the yes. government but that is not what happened in 2011 2011 was the first instance where we had a party not having a majority, but what happened then was the president took people only from his own party. So that the for the opposition to, in that scenario, to win, then one of the parties would have to have that plurality, that highest number of seats. Or the opposition parties would have to come together before the elections to collate so that their total number of seats would be in excess, as is the case now, except that they did not uh, mm. have an alliance before the elections, would be in excess of the number of seats of the, the single party that has the largest number of, of votes. So that a win-win situation in some regards, not the generic approach I used earlier, would be for either one opposition party to know, and really 
one should not speak about an opposition party yet in the election because in the election I think the slate is cleared and they're all contestants so that <laughs> for a party that was previously in the opposition to acquire the plurality, the most votes or for the parties prior to the election to come together and to form an alliance that allows them to have the majority uh, of votes and therefore to be called upon to form the government because their candidate would then be the president but another win-win situation would be if the party with plurality but not majority recognizes the spirit of the constitution and recognizes the difficulties we've had over the last three years into four years and go beyond uh, uh, their own party uh, to take persons from other parties to constitute a government in which case you have some kind of a national government so those are I would say are the scenarios in terms of um, winning. Okay. And as I said, winning is very generic. It's what the people want that they get and how they cast their vote to determine who wins. Okay. And really there's no opposition and there's no government at the election. There are contesting parties. Okay. Thank you. Could you provide some advice for voters on how they should, first of all, understand how to cast their vote and prioritize so that they would benefit from the vote that they cast? Well, first of all, let, let me go back to the very first thing we talked about. Mm -hmm. Voting is on the 11th of May. Yes. If you're going to vote, you have to be eligible. If you're going to be eligible, you must be registered. So that's critical. You must be registered. Any person who would have attained the age of 18 on or before the 30th of April 2015 will be eligible to vote. Let me repeat that. Any person who would have attained the age of 18 on or before 18th 30th will be eligible to vote. April 30th is our qualifying date. So all those young people we register for age 14. All of those young people who are registered and would be 18 on or before April 30th will be voters for the first time. All over 18s as of that date will be eligible to vote. But you must be registered. There are people who might not have been registered. And therefore in the normal course of elections we are going to have something called claims and objections which will start in the month of February. Persons who are not yet registered may approach GCOM registration offices mm. to put in a claim for a registration during the period of claims and objections. So the public is advised that if you are not yet registered and you are going to qualify, you are going to be 18 on or before April 30th, in, in the month of February you will have an opportunity to go and get registered and to get onto the roll. So that's the second thing that's important. And I'm coming backwards. So you can vote on the 11th once you meet the criteria, which is to be registered. And you can still be registered once you go to do a claim or an objection. A claim during the period that GCOM will shortly uh, advertise for claims and objections. During that period of claims and objections, persons may also conduct some other transactions. So for example, if you were transferred, if you have moved from where you were living to some other location, then you may go and have a transfer done. So you can have your name removed from the list in the area where you previously lived to a list in the area where you presently live so that you can vote in the area uh, where you live. And so people should be aware of that and prepare themselves for that if the need for them to do so arises. There are some people who because of physical disability may not be able to go to the place of poll. And those persons may also apply for proxies. And that will be done I think sometime in the month of March. And GCOM again will advertise when they are 
opening for applications for proxies. So people who are disabled, people who are hospitalized and things like that, may apply for a proxy and have someone identified to vote for them. And the person should be someone who uh, is voting in the same electoral division that they are registered to vote in. So disabled persons may exercise that option. Disabled persons may also exercise the option of when they go to vote to have someone accompany them who is also on the same list voting in the same mm. polling station to assist them to cast the vote or if they don't have such a person and they have thrust and faith in the presiding officer to ask the presiding officer to do that on their behalf in their presence. So those are the opportunities available uh, for uh, disabled persons to be able uh, to cast their vote. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. So now we've come to the end of our three-part question. And there you have it, viewers, the electoral system clarified the definition of a winning scenario and what you voters have to do to be a part of the 2015 elections and to be a part of your choice for uh, the government winning the election. I think there is one thing I did not refer to, which is sure. not uh, integral to the electoral system, but it has to do with the question you may have raised about the win-win situation. Um, one would expect uh, that voters would vote based on issues yes. rather than other things such as association and ethnicity because at the end of the day what politicians do is that they address issues when they're in government and in addressing these issues if the voting is based on ethnicity then you may well find that the issues of some people may not be addressed but you will also find that in that scenario, if you don't vote based on issues, you may have a government that is not at one with you on issues mm -hmm. and therefore will not address issues that you may wish to have addressed. So both those who vote for based on ethnicity 